Hello, so I'm Chris Johnson from the Archer team here at UPCT, and I'd just like to welcome you to this afternoon's Archer webinar. So our webinar this afternoon is given by Scott Brown from Plymouth University and Xiaohu Kuaf from STFC. Uh, and they're going to talk about the work they did on their ECSC project, uh, dynamic, developing dynamic load balancing library for WIS foam, which finished recently. So the PI of this project was uh, Deborah Greaves from Plymouth University. So if you have questions during the webinar, the best thing to do is to write them in the chat box. Uh, we'll keep an eye on this during the webinar, but in most cases, we'll probably um, take the actual questions or deal with the actual questions at the end of the webinar. So I would just like to hand over now to Scott Brown, who's going to start things off. OK, off you go, Scott. Thanks, Chris. Good afternoon, everybody. And thank you for attending this webinar on the development of a dynamic load balancing library for wave structure interaction problems. As Chris said, my name's Scott Brown. I'm from Plymouth University. And I'll be co-presenting this with Dr. Xiaohu Gyu from the Science and Technology Facilities Council. Um, next slide, please, shall we? So an introduction to, the, to what we're doing here. So this, all this work was conducted as part of the embedded CSE 1208 project and in association with the CCP WSI project, which I'll briefly introduce later. It's all conducted in the open source CFD software OpenFoam, and I'm going to give a brief overview of wave structure interaction problems and what we are trying to simulate. And the WSI foam solver, which is the focus of the project. We are then going to talk about the ECSE project in more detail and about the development of the dynamic load balancing library. And finally, I'm going to give an quick um, introduction to the CCP WSI project. Next slide, please, shall we? And again. So start with the motivation for, for this work. We, we, we simulate a wide range of problems, starting from the survivability of wave energy converters to other floating platforms, such as floating tidal or the interaction of focus wave events with FPSOs. So in this section, I'm just going to present some of our our previous work. So in this case, on this slide, we can see that there's survivability of wave energy converters and the work of Edward Ransley at Plymouth University. And what we're trying to highlight here is that we look at quite extreme events and we have we, we look at survivability. So we look at breaking waves, focus wave impacts, and all of these cases require um, expensive tools. We, we use dynamic mesh to capture the motion. We, we have wave generation. We have absorption turbulence. And of course, there's the device itself and its effects on the free surface. And so I'm going to just go through a, a few of our, our, our different um, problems and then explain what we're trying to do in the project. So next. Slide, please, shall we? So here's another case that we, we've simulated um, using OpenFoam. It's a, a floating tidal concept. Uh, I'll, I'll just say that everything that says new code in the slides is things that have been added to the CCP WSI repository. Uh, again, I'll give a link to that later in the presentation. But as you can see, we've got a lot going on in this simulation. We have the, the free surface, the movement of the barge. We have, you can't see it, but we have moorings attached. And also there's the spinning turbine and its effect on the fluid. And adding all this together, the computational expense is very high. And moving on to the next slide. And that's only using um, simplified turbine models. I mean, we, we could be running cases with spinning blades, which are actually blade resolved, and also 
the catenary mooring codes that, and you can see there's catenary moorings attached to the experimental data that um, that is in the bottom left hand corner which was conducted at Plymouth University. Um, I hope that that's all coming out clearly for everyone. It's a bit jumpy on my screen. Uh, next slide please, shall we? So, and press play please. Uh, the other cases that we... Sorry, it's complete. Okay, I'll have to explain what this is. So this is another project that was completed at Plymouth University. It's focusing on the aeration effects on a wave impact with fixed objects. And in this case, we have a, an FBSO at the top, top right, which we've done numerically. And there's an experimental data of it hitting a, a flexible wall at the bottom. So the added structural dynamics and hydroelasticity add another complication to the problem. Next slide, please. And I'm hoping this one will play. Nope. Nope. Okay. Um, that's unfortunate. Okay. So again, it's to do with slamming loads and it, in this case, there was a, a plate being dropped into the water and we had large a large splash essentially that and in order to to model that using open foam you require quite a lot of complex tools including a, a water air bubble mixture model next slide please shall we uh, and finally we have problems relating to launch and recovery operations and in particular the the free surface flows between the two vessels um, in this case that we have quite a lot of complications due to the large domain required to capture the problem fully as well as having the very small scale effects happening between the, the two vessels which is another reason that the problems are quite hard to simulate Next, please. So in summary, we have quite complicated problems when considering WSI um, interactions. And these are computationally expensive and therefore require case specific requirements such as aeration and moving mesh, etc. And one way to reduce the cost is to use the high fertility models only when necessary. This has been led to us developing a, a multi-region solvent named WSI frame through the CCP WSI associated, project, associated projects, um, largely at Manchester Metropolitan University. The aim of WSI foam is to split the numerical model into multiple regions, each of which solves different sets of equations. For example, a typical simulation such as is shown on the screen is you would have a, a large domain and the majority of the domain would be solved by a computationally efficient code such as a fully nonlinear potential theory solver. And then incompressible and compressible Navier-Stokes equations are only solved around the object of interest to capture the aeration effects and the motion of the device. Next, please. So that, however, the um, a multi-region approach isn't the only method to reduce the computational cost. Another way would be to parallelize the code to benefit from the increasingly available high-performance computing facilities. Although OpenFoam is parallel ready, previous versions have been considered to be suboptimal MPI performance, um, but Recently in OpenFoam 5.x, the, the progress has been made in this area for improvements in IO performance. However, it still uses static domain decomposition, which only allows the domain to be balanced at the first time step. And if based on a single property, such as the number of mesh nodes and their spatial distribution. Next, please, shall we? Oh, I've missed one. Is, can you go back a slide, please? Okay. Oh no, that's the right one. Mm -hmm. Sorry. The so 
since typical WSI simulations tend to include factors such as wave relaxation and mesh motion, which are potentially inhomogeneous with respect to the mesh, this project aims to improve the efficiency of WSI foam through the development of a dynamic load balancing library. This work will be conducted in three stages, porting of the codes to OpenFoam 5.x to use the improved IO, introduction of dynamic load balancing functionality, and finally benchmarking. At Plymouth University, we were in charge of porting the code and we updated the syntax and procedures of WSI Foam, which was originally written for OpenFoam 2.3.1 to be compatible with OpenFoam 5. This allows the model to use the updated IO functionality and volume of fluid schemes, which have been included since the original code was written. Furthermore, the, the code was designed to be compatible with Waves to Foam, which is a commonly used wave generation software, along with OpenFoam's latest turbulence modeling and six degree of freedom software. The new code was verified in multiple cases, including a two region dam break, such as the one shown on screen. So you can see that there's two regions. There's a left-hand region, which was incompressible, a right-hand region, which was compressible. And the white gap in between shows the shared boundary between the two regions and it passes smoothly between the two regions. Um, but we also considered a free region, sorry, <coughs> a free region floating wave energy converter in focused waves and it, it performed well. Uh, so now we're going to, I'm going to hand you back to uh, Xiaohu so that he can explain the development of the dynamic load balancing library. Thanks, Scott. Uh, thanks for give all those application background for this project. Um, so next slide. So before I give into the other uh, implementation technical details, uh, first thing I would like to show you the profiling using tool for the WSR4. So in this um, diagram, which shows the whole function costs and the from main function is actually going through three three uh, branches, uh, which is trying to do the relaxation zone, which is when you get a wave and in the two boundaries, you're actually trying to uh, do a relaxation, trying to um, filter the non-physical uh, phenomena. So, well, and you can see the, those uh, numbers from uh, going through, so, um, so, First thing is you, you can see the all the line number of uh, this line code code line numbers and then from main you going to let's say from type one you have one nine forty seven is the time to take to go into here and then from the here you can also oh, sorry you can see they actually all go into MPR with all so from uh, here you can see for type one you're actually waiting about 1901 seconds just to wait there and uh, the type three is actually the main computational cost so you can see from uh, 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 you can see they actually takes like a, sorry this is, I shouldn't really use my uh, mouse so it take like a 166 uh, no 16 so uh, one nearly uh, 2,000 seconds to calculate the uh, localized sales. So this is basically uh, three types calculation depends on your original mesh. So if you are falling in that most calculation ma mesh, then you go into type three, and that takes most time. And where the rest of the regions or uh, sitting idle to wait the the whole comp uh, computation to fin to finish. So and this happens with uh, different time steps. So so you can't really pre-decided which region should be given more uh, uh, co uh, more uh, CPU cores and which region should be given less. So in that, in this case, we we do need dynamic load balancing mechanism in uh, uh, in with uh, in in WSR four. So that's why we propose this proposal in ECSE. And uh, so before doing that, I'd like to uh, give some introduction how you actually to introduce uh, dynamic dynamic load balancing mechanism into the WSI form. And in the, in the meantime, we also keep in mind want of this project, we hope this library can be applied to other uh, applications which using open form. 
So in order to do dynamic load balancing, you have to understand the open form mesh classes. So the first thing is you can see the pretty mesh, which is from the name, you can know this is the most, uh, uh, this is basically a, a base class for the mesh. And uh, this basically trying to read any uh, data that's generated from the mesh generation tools. It could be coming from external uh, uh, mesh generation tools from OpenFORM. You can also coming from like a snappy hex mesh. So it has a two, uh, two uh, what I say, the functions. One is uh, related with geometric data, which functions to calculate cell centrals, cell volumes, face centrals, face uh, areas. Another thing is a, a topology information, which is connected to structures, uh, which all being uh, uh, all using these virtual functions. So, which provide a capability to do uh, 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 to do a runtime uh, poly, uh, polyform, uh, polyformism. And uh, this is more related to like a points, which is trying to calculate point to cells, point to age, point to face, and faces, face owners, face neighbors. So once you understand the pri primitive mesh, this is base mesh class, you can uh, uh, then uh, go into the next, which is a uh, poly mesh. Uh, but you know, before going to the poly mesh, you really need to understand open form runtime selection mechanism. This means given so many classes, so during your program or your code running or when you're trying to design your code, how you actually uh, decided which mesh class you're going to use and how do you actually use it uh, in your code. So the open form provided is called runtime selection mechanism. So first thing is called virtual constructor. This is a basic hack for C++. Generally, C++ doesn't really allow you to build a uh, object uh, constructor because the all um, the constructor must be the same type as object. And so with this uh, runtime selection mechanism, is basically providing a way to do uh, a method for in initialization. So uh, given a scenario, say you have a, a solver, you want to apply different boundary conditions. And this boundary condition, you basically define a, a generic uh, base class for boundary condition class. And then you can apply different boundaries, say uh, uh, absorbing boundary, wall boundary, and non-reflect boundaries, non-sleep boundary. All these kind of different boundary can be applied, but you need to really to derive from the generic boundary condition. So with this, you you uh, what they trying to do is trying to give your runtime selection works by creating a hash table of derived construct pointers in base. So you define the pre, uh, uh, you define it uh, uh, in advance, and then. Uh, it helps you to create a hash table in base and curtains constructors point to index by different uh, name you've been named for different boundary condi uh, con conditions. And then you can, using this derived class to add themselves to the list, you can select it at the runtime. Uh, so it basically created a selector functions in base called, and this uh, is actually, uh, uh, called new, which is, uh, be careful about the new is actually capital N, not the uh, lowercase, which is uh, actually create a new class or this is memory management for. So that's, uh, that's uh, give you roughly uh, how OpenFORM do runtime connection, runtime selection for different classes you're using in your code. So the second thing is, so so after talking that, so the poly mesh is basically uh, a, a, a kind of a mesh, basically a kind of mesh is using poly polyhedral. So it's inherited the base class from primitive mesh and uh, it's using virtual constructor, which I just talked before, to redefine your points, faces, face owners, face neighbors for polyhedral mesh. And they also provide IO function for read mesh from file, like a, a, this is basically a real mesh con container. 
So this is the second thing you, you definitely need to use for poly mesh. And, and the third mesh class called FV mesh. Uh, we all know OpenFOAM actually using finite volume methods. So when you define your uh, your mesh, you need apply your numerical methods. So this OpenFOAM give you another new class, another class called finite volume uh, FV mesh. So it, in in the functions, you basically do the FV uh, discretization. So you, for example, face area motion fluxes and face area vectors, face area magnitudes. And so once you know FV mesh, you need to then working on because most uh, real application all using dynamic mesh. So OpenFOAM provide another mesh class called dynamic FV mesh. Here is only um, a dynamic mesh base class. So any real, uh, any, uh, real applications they actually use the derived class from dynamic FV mesh. So in this dynamic FV mesh is actually quite simple. So you only have this constructor and deconstructor. And the, it provides you a update function, which basically what you function for your mesh movement. And because you normally using uh, quite a large number of mesh, so you also provide a parallel functionality, which is using uh, this there uh, using together with P stream class. And uh, what this update function do is basically once you do any uh, topological mesh on and it also trying to uh, do uh, mesh redistribution using this update interface. So what we do is actually trying to target in this uh, load balance, uh, dynamic load balance library is trying to using called dynamic refine FMA mesh. It's basically trying to support uh, dynamic load balancing when you have uh, a mesh refinement involved. So to understand how do to understand how the so before we do add dynamic load balancing into dynamic refinement F, uh, dynamic refine FV mesh, we need to understand what exactly dynamic FV mesh do. So open, open form uh, dynamic FV uh, refine FV mesh is actually uh, use quite different uh, mesh class. So this major three main uh, mesh class is a uh, hex rate. This is basically hexagonal mesh for refinement. So each hexagonal mesh actually can be split into eight cells, and so this is one of the key uh, uh, mesh class you need to to know how to use it, and then dynamic FV mesh and a dynamic F refinement F refinement mesh as well. So the next slide is just to give you a hexagonal mesh refinement. So it's splitting hexagonal mesh into eight subcells, and it provides functionality to do two things. First thing is the mesh cutters trying to split cells, and also provide your uh, uh, mesh repartition capability. And the polytop change is basically because you do refinement and also do coursing, which is unrefinement. You need adding cells, and you, you need removing cells, and possibly you also need modifying uh, cells. Depends on uh, on on mesh adaptivity you're actually doing. Uh, in this case, I think the current uh, Current capabilities all uh, basically doing um, uh, refinement and coursing. So it's just my, my understanding is basic edge refine uh, edge uh, adaptivity. So you basically just adding and removing. Uh, depends on your refinement or unrefinement. And uh, before you do that, you, you need to call a function called set refinement. And in order to do coursing, you need a, uh, you need a, a build a refinement tree. At the moment, I think refinement history is actually reading, uh, which basically uh, using I/O. So basically, uh, you need a file to remember the refinement tree uh, during your refinement during the whole uh, adaptivity re uh, process. And then 
just give you how the dynamic refine FME mesh working. So I, I basically already described quite a few already. So you can see there's a two process. So if you have a refine, then you have to select sales for refinement. You know where you do refine, and there is a criteria you actually to change. And they also, once you decided which cell to refine, you have you can actually cut cells with mesh cutter, and then you can update the refinement tree uh, uh, for the later uh, uh, operation. And, and because you this running in parallel, you need to think about uh, that that this actually related to redistribute mesh. Be uh, in most cases. Um, don't actually do uh, much about uh, redistribution in terms of uh, load balancing, that, but you do uh, distribute because of there is some, uh, uh, there is, at the beginning when you do refinement, you have to partition mesh. So that's an added cost when you, uh, when you do the partition mesh. So the, so what we consider here is actually in, in if we need to redistribute uh, after your refinement because number of mesh nodes could be uh, much more than the other uh, 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 partitions. So that's causing you a lot of balancing issues. So so in this case, we what we need to do? How do we do redistribution? Redistribution. So when we do retrieve stream, first things you need, uh, how do we do uh, 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 partition of mesh? Therefore, and how do we make sure that the partition uh, cost is mi minimum? So, so the majority uh, work of developing dy dynamic load balancing is actually in this green part. So we need first things, first thing we need a, a lightweight partitioner. And then we think about how to distribute the data uh, uh, combining with the mesh. I think that's uh, this slides. And then, so yeah, so I just mentioned about we need a lightweight partitioner. So generally, there is quite a few in open form. So uh, in dynamic, uh, 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 no, in uh, decomposition method. So you can see you can simple structure decomposition, simple cut, yeah, and also uh, manual decomposition and geometry uh, decomposition. So they're all available for you to use. They also serial partitioner like a matrix decomposition, uh, multi-level decomposition, uh, and the scotch decomposition and do the they also support the parallel decomposition methods like PT scotch uh, and in fact PT scotch also being used in this snappy hex mesh so if you can if you have a really large mesh uh, large mesh you can when you're using snappy hex mesh you actually can use in parallel it can be run with the snappy hex mesh and it will automatically call PT scotch um, but we have compared from our previous experiences, uh, we want, we, we thinking Parmatis is most lightweight and also uh, most stable uh, parallel uh, partition tools. So in this case, we basically added new um, Parmatis decompose uh, class into this decomposition methods, which is a base class for all the uh, decomposition uh, tools and uh, this is not something new I think uh, in open form extended they actually already implemented Parmatis decomps there so so this is basically we we borrowed from there and also I think it make it work with open form a foundation uh, now once we have this lightweight uh, with the decomposition tools uh, like Parmetis, and then we start to really uh, to to put our effort to adding a dynamic load, load balancing mechanism into uh, uh, WSR form. So first things is uh, uh, let's just to go through the algorithm how to do it. So first step is it refinement files with each MPI partition. This is basically serial. Uh, 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 
zero um, mesh adaptivity in each M MPI partition. And then naturally you would thinking number of mesh nodes in, in one partition could be much larger than other partition. So the, CAC, the total computation will be imp imbalanced. So, but first thing is you, how you need to detect the imbalance. So we, we defined um, uh, max imbalance parameters. So it's basically local number of cells, take away ideal local number of cells, then divided by ideal local number of cells times 100%. So that's, and find the maximum, maximum in each partition. So once it uh, exits your uh, residue, you, you start to uh, uh, load imbalance. So what you need to do during load imbalance is you need to construct the level zero graph nodes. It's basically your original mesh. And then calculate each node's weight with the uh, uh, equation two. And then after that, you decided you're going to repartition. So you call repartition with um, um, uh, with uh, uh, parameters. And uh, here, you need to remember because when you do the uh, uh, repartition, you need to consider you each partition should have have the whole uh, history of refinement. So this is basically we need to add a constraint for the refinement history, which is actually provided by um, already in uh, in OpenFORM Foundation. So in the part, I think that was in the decompose part dict, you can actually just say we're not uh, we need add constraint uh, with refinement history. And then do uh, repartition, and you can redistribute the mesh and variable fields with mesh cutter, and then uh, correct boundary volumes of all fields. So they all can be. Uh, so this is all exist uh, tools you can do uh, within OpenFORM Foundation. So yeah, that's the imbalance. Uh, uh, make algorithm and uh, here is basically what we do is uh, because you have dynamic F mesh based class and there are derived class you can see including top change F mesh uh, and dynamic motion mesh dynamic motion solver and also inject F mesh. Um, we are particularly targeting on dynamic refine FB mesh, but in order to do that, we actually need dynamic refinement F mesh calling a new class which we call, we define called dynamic balanced FB mesh, because dynamic FB mesh doesn't provide you this mechanism. So in principle, if we everybody call dynamic balanced FB mesh, then it should automatically to do the dynamic load balancing for other kind of a. Uh, 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 Move, mesh movement solver. So how to use it, the uh, dynamic load balance library? So what you only need to do is you need add um, uh, a li library, what we uh, developed called lab dynamic, lab dynamic balance every mesh that I saw in your control dict. And in the decompose parametric, you need to use method parametics. Uh, that sounds quite simple. And in fact, in fact, you only need changes to and about uh, if you. But at the moment, we only uh, uh, we only support uh, this mesh uh, mesh refinement. So it's called dynamic refine F mesh. The reason is because in other methods, by counting a number of mesh nodes, is not enough to be uh, parameters for those other like. Uh, uh, other mesh movement because uh, mesh number of mesh nodes may be same. So you actually need another mechanism to define your max imbalance parameter. Say for example, uh, CPU runtime. But this will be our to do work. At the moment, we only counting number of mesh nodes for uh, uh, imbalance parameters. So. Now uh, I think I, I hope you 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 basically understand uh, how, how we add dynamic load balancing and here just show the results and process analysis. So here uh, is show using two uh, 
MPI partitions show you how the mesh beam moved each other. This is just the surface. And this one is to show your uh, eight MPI partitions, how the mesh moved between during each time step. I hope you can see it. How the mesh moving uh, at the beginning to the end. And uh, to measure your load imbalance and uh, efficiency of your load imbalance, we basically try to uh, measure two things. First thing is uh, uh, how how the mesh Im max uh, imbalance uh, uh, involves with the uh, uh, with the whole uh, uh, simulation. So here we calculate um, more than 400 time steps. Uh, I think this is 17 million mesh. I'm uh, using 16 nodes, using up from 16 nodes to 64 nodes, which is uh, uh, on the archer. And you can see from uh, at the beginning, um, the maximum imbalance is very, very high, which is more than like 500%. And uh, then you start using uh, 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 Lot in a lot in balance mechanism, uh, balance mechanism. So you can see it's reduced to so once it's more than uh, I think it was more than ten percent. If you uh, if you ask for the uh, 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 ask for to call in lot of, uh, balance uh, libraries to balance the mesh between each other, and uh, from this graph you can see. Um, this uh, once your MPI partition increase, your your load in your balancing frequency is actually also increase as well. I think that's a basic idea. Uh, um, uh, that's a I think this figure tell you. Uh, another one is basically since we do a lot in balance, we really careful about how the mesh. Uh, being redistributed. What's the cost uh, of mesh redistribution? So the, we measured the mesh update overhead. Uh, so this is again 17 million mesh and if, uh, uh, MPR partition from 16 nodes to 64 nodes, which is up to 16, I think, uh, 1,500 uh, 1, MPI partitions. Um, you can see at the beginning, if you're using less map, uh, MPI partitions, your your cost of mass update actually high. I think it's reasonable is because if you're using less MPI partition, your uh, num mesh volume to to be uh, for the communication going to be high. Therefore, your cost is high. But if you're using more MPI partitions, you can see. Um, the MPI cost because you have uh, frequently calling uh, mesh updates. Therefore, uh, you have more times of communication if you're using more MPI partitions. But the uh, total cost for mesh update overhead uh, actually quite uh, small compared with uh, less number of uh, uh, um, uh, using less number of MPI partitions. So uh, next thing is, is trying to compare with using dynamic load balancing with uh, no dynamic load balancing. So this is Dambrick. Uh, if you see this, uh, um, uh, see we can see with uh, a smaller number of MPI, a uh, smaller number of mesh nodes, we got speed up about about four, and where with larger number of mesh nodes, you got more than five times. Uh, speed uh, speed up just by using uh, uh, dynamic load balance libraries. So another thing is we can we are mostly interesting about strong scaling, this, which is uh, more about time to solutions. So you can see uh, from uh, 384 to 16 to 1500, uh, we got very decent. Uh, uh, very decent uh, speed up. Another thing is, when you actually do actually profiling for other open form class, it's actually quite difficult to get the get the profiling uh, out. 
one of the things is uh, if you don't uh, solve the uh, load imbalancing, which is the key things for performance, so it's really hard to actually tackle the issue, other performance issue, because this is basically all the all other performance uh, issue being hided by the load imbalance. So this is actually provide uh, us a, a new opportunity to further optimize the open form by providing dynamic load balancing. So this is going to be more interesting work afterwards. We want to do a, a, a thoroughly providing again just to see what the again what the major performance neck bottleneck again. Yeah, just to give a summary uh, and discussion. So basically. Uh, the whole software fr framework being ported open form 5.x uh, with the right benchmarks being validated. And also, we develop a new timing load balancing uh, library for uh, WSI form, and it also can be used by other applications with very small effort to adapt. Uh, there are also ongoing work. There are also some issues uh, which is more I/O related. So we're thinking because there are a lot of uh, call I/O dict during your simulation. And this is key features are open for, but for performance matches, it would not be a good idea. So we need thinking how to get rid of this. Um, another thing is um, yeah, at the at the moment uh, uh, we get decent um, speed up, but I think we. Uh, we could do a better job if we continue working on this, so trying to optimize further. Yeah, I will give this hand it back to Scott. Thanks, Shelley. Uh, so that was the the ECSC project. I just want to quickly introduce the CCP WSI project because it's where we're going to store the final code. So the CCP project is a collaborative computational project in wave structure interaction. Can I have the next slide, please, shall we? And it's funded by EPSRC and has been running since 2015. It's a collaboration between six UK-based research institutes, uh, the six at the bottom of the screen right now. And it also brings together a large number of other relevant companies and academic institutions. Next slide, please. So it's, it has many objectives, but the one that's relevant to this project is that it's trying to grow a community of researchers and is providing a database of benchmarking test cases and a repository of open source software. And next slide, please, shall we? So, they provide a code repository, which is hosted on GitHub. And in the future, um, we will put in all of the work from this ECSE project, uh, including WSI foam in OpenFoam version 5.x, the dynamic load balancing libraries, and finally, the test cases that we have run previously. Um, it, the repository already includes many of many contributions from other pieces of work and other projects from the CCP WSI community. And if you want further details on how to get involved with this and start contributing or accessing the CCP WSI code, then please follow the link below or contact Edward Ransley at Plymouth University. So next slide, please. So finally, we would like to gratefully acknowledge the funding and support of the embedded CSE program. And if you have any questions, then feel free to ask them. Thank you for listening. Thank you. So thanks very much to you both. Um, so I'd just like to ask if anybody has any questions. Thanks to our two speakers this afternoon for an interesting talk. Thanks very much. OK, so bye then, everybody. Thank Chris. Thank you. Bye. Bye.